Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Davis. I am an educator at the Illinois State Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight for touring Edgewise, the new, new exhibition gallery talk. So without further ado, I will turn it over to history curator Erica Holst and art curator uh, Doug Stapleton. Hi, welcome to Edgewise, finding a voice in the world made for men. We're excited to debut this exhibit in Women's History Month. And this exhibition draws on our permanent collections to pull out objects of artwork associated with women and gender minority. For so while our, um, we're thinking about the exhibition, we say we wanted to work with the permanent collection. Uh, many of the items that we pull for the exhibition are so recent acquisitions, which mean they're new items that have come to us that we haven't shown. So it's an opportunity to kind of highlight that. But in this finer discussion around what this might look like, uh, I want to give a shout out to our co curators as well, too our museum library, right? librarian Tracy Pearsall, and our curator of education, Elizabeth Dumas. The four of us worked on this exhibit. And Elizabeth was the one who thought with, with this history about coming out we could use that as a lens. And starting from that point, it was thinking about like not just women, but what would an exhibition look like that had uh, you know, sort of female voice or, or female focus with a feminist lens? So that we could include queer, non binary uh, voices as well, too, and talk about that larger. You know, uh, idea about just, I mean, the title Edwise is a little bit of a joke about like, I couldn't get a word of Edwise. Uh, you know, just this idea of like in the day to day life, but also in history and in our art books and our history books, like how we can search for these stories at the best. Absolutely. And not just, you know, famous, big, splashy people, but we want to uplift all voices like the. Um, factory workers whose names are lost to history and the um, farmers' wives and people who didn't make it into world renown, but they had a story and they expressed themselves through the objects that are preserved. So we have a lot of stories to it's tell. Long, Should yeah. we get started with the salon mm -hmm. wall? Well, yeah. And so one of the ideas, too, this is our, thank you, Elizabeth, is on our education curator, said, let's do another salon style. So uh, we're standing in front of this wall, which features artwork from our museum collection, uh, which are all made by women makers. Looking at women, for the most part, sometimes looking at themselves or looking at other uh, people, but then they're mostly looking back at us. Uh, so we wanted this uh, kind of moment where you come in and you just see this, you know, this kind of chorus of each voice coming at you. One of them, who is a local person, is uh, this uh, portrait of the bar. You want to speak about this? This is Echo Mars. And for those of you who are watching us from Springfield, this is a local woman. Um, she was born in 1876, right here in town. She studied art um, at the um, Cincinnati School of Art. And she eventually, with her um, longtime partner um, in the love of her life, my husband Squire, they made their way to Paris and they were pedaling around with Gertrude Stein and these wonderful Bohemian very free ladies. Um, but they did keep their roots in Springfield as well here. Um, they were instrumental in helping to found, uh, found the Springfield Art Association. Eventually, they returned to Massachusetts and uh, established an artist colony there. So, just one of the many fascinating people. Right. And this kind of history, it's like women's history, but also queer history, but queer history as well, too. Um, she, uh, Ethel uh, Ma, worked professionally. I mean, they created a career as illustrators and artists, you know, associated with the Provincetown uh, Artist Colony. But in their time in Paris, where they eventually settled in France, they became the inspiration for one of Gertrude Stein's her first. Eight poems. One of the first eight poems ever written. It's, it's, uh, it's a piece of um, groundbreaking literature. It's the first time that the word gay is used in literature to denote homosexuality. Yeah. It's about uh, this fur and the scheme. Yeah. And code names for Mont Hunt Squire and Ethel Mars. So, yeah, so Springfield has this <laughs> international reach. And what I love about this salon. 
one while I have the cat tip to you is that um, there's a lot of discussion in culture about the male gaze and the idea of how women are sometimes looked to present themselves for women's viewing pleasure. Um, we just sort of turn that on our head here with the salon wall. And now when we are subject to the female gaze, we, we get to the women the agency and they are all looking back at us. And there's also another part of like the uh, trail of women, especially on the other side, is that we have to be stuck in this notion that everyone, everything and everyone else we do is that women are not doing. And the women are looking at themselves and portraying themselves. They show us a whole different range of what it is to be a human. And the idea of necessarily the classic beautiful pose, the classic beautiful image, and it becomes subverted, whether intentionally or just through observation and lived experience. This is who I am. This is who I'm looking at. Uh, I don't have to use this uh, pretense or have to use this, this model or this, this subjectivity. I can look at them as who they are, or see myself, or train myself as who I am. So it challenges some of those uh, notions are powerful pieces. So we want you to come and see it in person. It's actually take that the whole second floor right so um, we're going to move around to <laughs> one of our interior buildings. We're going to take you on a little tour uh, of some of the highlights. We're not going to show you that because we want you to come. And as we're moving along here, uh, Lorna, our uh, camera person, will be giving you a little bit of a taste of what this does on the tour. Works by the Warden and Thomas Sigler and Viva Lair. Wonderful sort of contemplative group gallery. But one of the, the central galleries, or the North Central Gallery here, features mostly women, but also women and queer artists who take a very sharp, decided political stance in their work. And I think this has been an aspect of feminist movement, women's rights movement, is this association, this knowledge, or this understanding that. The personal is political. And so um, ideas of, uh, of uh, not just like what affects my life, but how do I as a human move and have agency out in the world and speak to the larger problems, the larger conflicts of the world. So mm -hmm. well, I'd like to direct your attention to um, the Fair Lady acquisition. It's one of my favorites. This is a t-shirt from the 1970s and says, some leaders are born women. And this was donated to us by Sally Pencrazio. And when she donated this t-shirt, I asked how she got into the women's rights movements in the 70s. And she said that when she was applying to graduate school, she didn't get into her first choice program to pursue a um, doctorate of education because she was told that women just get knocked up. And so they didn't accept women into a program. She finally did get into a program, and when she graduated and it was time to hunt for a job, her male colleagues were getting um, job offers right and left, and she finally um, landed a job offer at a university that would only give her a one-year contract, not a 10-year track position, because um, they were told that they don't hire women with small children at home. And so um, Sally Penfazio had not been an especially political person before that, but having experienced um, this, this rampant discrimination firsthand, she threw herself into the movement to um, pass the Equal Rights Amendment. And so she was an active campaigner and she wore this shirt when she was attending ERA meetings. Um, unfortunately, this, um, it did not pass in Illinois um, until about two or three years ago, I believe, um, but uh, she, she was kind of hailed when it did pass, and we're still waiting for that to become the law of the land. Um, it's a ratification that requires um, three quarters um, approval by the states, and in the almost 40 years now, um, since uh, since it began to be ratified, some of the statute of limitations has lapsed. So long story short, um, women in this country are still waiting for uh, equal protection under the Constitution. And actually next to it too, I think it's another recent acquisition, this uh, poster uh, for Joan Jet Black for president. Um, and Joan was, uh, this is in 1992, uh, Joan was the candidate for the Queer Nation Chicago Party uh, running for president. 
And Joan was a Chicago-based, uh, originally Detroit-based, but then moved to Chicago uh, drag performer. Uh, and this was Joan's presidential poster by any means necessary, which takes some of the visual uh, cues from the Black Panther uh, visual like graphics. Um, and uh, but in this case, Joan's photo moment is like super sporter <laughs> uh, as well too. And this was a t-shirt that was also used. Uh, Joan also ran for uh, mayor of Chicago prior to uh, this first presidential run in 1992. And so at this particular time too, with Queer Nation, this was in the early 90s, uh, the AIDS epidemic had polarized many people in this country around the issue of like safety, security, health, like privacy. And um, uh, within the gay community, there was a lot of anger and upset around the fact that uh, gay people were being like marginalized politically, medically, as well as socially. And so Queer Nation is party formed as a very vocal, but sometimes satiric, uh, angry, but also playful at the same time, means of putting the political agenda out there that actually like very good drag performers, takes the reality and sort of turns it on its head, finds the satire, but also finds the really deep moments of beauty and the, the awesomeness of it, the power of it well. So, and all of the pieces, all the stories along with it's just great little stories in these sort of very small, small moments. And I think you need to probably talk about this piece in the center, um, mentioning the, the AIDS epidemic, and this is kind of our showstopper um, installation right here. Yeah, this is a recent exhibition. This is created by Bernstein, who is a visual artist in Chicago, uh, who was. Uh, Fled Germany during the World War II as a child, as part of the Kinder Transport, which was uh, an effort to take uh, Jewish children, uh, children of this in uh, Nazi Germany, out of the country and sort of find new homes in the state, uh, in England and then eventually the United States. Uh, so, throughout her career, because of her family's, her lots of the family's the devastation with the uh, World War II with the Nazis. And with the Holocaust, um, uh, uh, her entire life has been sort of driven by this need to speak to those who are struggling to find a voice, those who are facing injustice, uh, those who are um, not at the center of power. And she speaks very clearly and very passionately about this. So, this piece, River, was uh, a piece that she made, and I have to look enough to take out my head. It's 1992, not the 1990s, uh, was actually already into fairly long into the. Uh, is that later thing or is that? 2005. It's later. It's 2005. Very good. I'm like, oh, right. I was looking at the B2. I said that B2 earlier. But, anyways, at this point, the case of the other had already been, you know, uh, going on for a decade, a little bit longer. But there had been uh, an uptick in her zone side. Section among women, women of color, uh, black community. And so, this early sort of association of AIDS with like, the gay community, which had been sort of dealt with, not eradicated, but sort of dealt with uh, within that community, was now spreading to other, other populations which did not have the same resources and voices that many of the people in the gay community had. Um, and sort of polarized by this political statements by Chicago queer nation artists like Gerda will continue this conversation to look at what does it mean to like represent the affected body, one that we try to contain, um, one that we try to like by laws and by moral morality and by social structures, we try to contain something which is like living, which is moving, which is affecting people's lives and spilling out. We wish we could spill it out even more, but we just don't have the room. But if you can just imagine, like, how do you represent something like that? What would it look like for you to have like the task of carrying a message, of wanting to carry a message, and not just simply put it into a box and shut it away? And <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> what should we move on to? Let's move on to these guys. Well, I hope you can all do this. Are we doing good over here? So we're going to move over to this East Gallery, which has some of the quality of the work that's in this. Celebratory qualities. Also, a fairly recent acquisition. And this is called Winter Celebration. And this is by a living uh, quilt artist named Trish Williams. And Trish just has a beautiful backstory of the inspiration of this quilt. Um, Trish talks about when she was a child, she remembers her mother having her sisters and her girlfriends over in the kitchen. And um, as these women were preparing food, they would put the music on and they would dance. And Trish was just so moved by this as a young girl. Um, these were women who had cares and responsibilities. Not all their lives were easy, but in that moment, they were able to set it aside and just be present and uh, celebrate life together. And then as an adult, she's sort of reflecting with this quilt about the power of female joy and the power of female community and how that um, is the root of so much female strength. It's a really wonderful celebratory piece. And just the pattern on pattern is a sort of really left the quality to it as well too. And especially just the black and white, just using this like very basic pattern and just letting the energy move through. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And that's part of a, a seasonal series. So for winter, she did choose that palette of black and white. And we have another quilt here that I should probably point out. Um, if anyone is a fan of quilt making, you might have been familiar with the work of Bertha Stegi. They're some of the treasures of our collection. Um, and what I love about this quilt is that this is um, Bertha, she called it her scrapbook quilt. And in this, each little vignette, um, very skillfully, I mean, she was a masterful seamstress, but she creates little vignettes that highlight her life from her parents' wedding in 1889 to when she was a baby, to growing up with her children, all the way down to um, her advanced age when her daughters are grown and started to have grandchildren. And this is going to tell her story. And in reading biographies, biographies of her. I was struck by the way that people labeled her throughout her life. Um, she was a stained glass artist in the beginning of her life, so the census called her an artist. Um, then she got married um, to um, Bernhard Staney, and people called her a wife, and then soon after, a mother. And when she hit the, the peak of her uh, quilting prowess when she kind of came into her own as a quilter. Um, the newspapers called her um, Chicago's quilting queen, but they also called her a Chicago housewife and a 63-year-old grandmother. So it's all these labels being put on her, and I, I love the way that in this quilt she takes control of her narrative and she says, this is my story on my own terms. This is my life and how I choose to define myself. And I really, um, you know, see it as an inspiration for all of us to take control of our own stories and, and tell them in ways that are meaningful to us and ignore the labels that would be imposed on us from the outside. It's fascinating. And we have on this wall over here uh, a series of clothing, garments, whatever we call them, but um, so much of the history for women, for, for women has been wrapped up with, you know, fashion clothing. Or good or bad, I guess you could say. Um, and in this case, we're actually looking at all these pieces that were made for by these women for themselves and their friends. For, for their Do you want to talk about some of these? Right, these stories? are all handmade garments. Um, so there's unique craftsmanship to each one, and each one tells a different story. Um, this garment belongs to a uh, drag artist by the name of Mahogany Knight. And for those of you, again, living in Springfield, um, Miss Knight is sort of a legendary name. She's sort of the, the matriarch of the Springfield drag community at this point. Um, and Mahogany is an upbeat, vivacious, bold, um, performer who really puts on a show for their audience and, and the nature of drag is boundary pushing um, and it's 
fun and, and the motivation of creating this stunning garment was welcome to Vegas. She wants to show her audience the time of her life. And in doing so and seeing something, you know, perhaps that um, if, if one is new to drag performing that one hasn't seen before, you know, a, a man portraying a woman, but having the time of your life, being in community with the audience, being also in conversation with the performer, um, how we also see those boundaries break down and communities form. And one of the things that's most powerful to her about the drag community is the sense of community, um, the way that performances will come together to raise money for causes such as um, helping victims of the AIDS crisis in the 90s to um, helping um, LGBTQIA plus youth today. Um, so using that sense of fun, entertainment, boundary pushing, and wrapping it all up to create a community that um, maybe expands the way people think and also uh, gives back to the world around. And next to it, um, we have an incredibly fun outfit, and this is created by uh, Sky Kitty Group of Chicago, who is a non-binary uh, Philippinex neuroqueer. And um, Sky's inspiration for creating a line of really vibrant and fun and playful garments uh, for non-binary individuals goes back to their high school days when they were looking for a chest binder, a garment that's meant to flatten breasts. And um, this garment, the ones that they could find um, were um, in, in flesh colors or nude colors. They were very clinical. The, the whole idea of a flesh or nude tone um, has sort of racist undertones. And so um, after a, a, an illness that was sort of a turning point in Sky's life, they decided that they would create their own line of garments um, and follows a, a, what, what their philosophy is called radical visibility that um, people with um, uh, who, who live with disabilities, who are non binary, are asked by society to, to fit themselves in corners and become invisible. And this guy said, No way, you know, we are going to um, be proud to celebrate ourselves and accentuate ourselves. So, this is an original creation um, by Sky. And next to it is a, a garment that we're going back um, more than 100 years now to a um, very fluffy dress that was created in the 19 teens. And this is the handiwork work of a woman named Caroline Duffy, and she lived in Champaign, Illinois, and she became a dressmaker as a teenager, and her sisters were seamstresses too. They were part of a working class family, and everyone in the family worked to support um, their family. She got married, and as was the custom, she put aside her needle and focused on her husband and soon her young daughter. Well, not too long after her daughter was born, um, her husband abandoned them and she was left to her own devices. And so she picked up her needle again and through her own um, talent and determination and effort, uh, she created a successful and thriving business in a time when women weren't always encouraged to do so. She ended up employing seamstresses of herself, of her own, and um, developing a reputation of someone who really saw her client. Um, each creation that she made was very carefully tailored, not just to the person, the client's physical characteristics, but she took into consideration their coloring, the way they moved, their lifestyle, what their personality was, and really tried to bring out the best um, and, and reflect and let her clients be seen. And our final garment here um, is another living artist. Um, this was created by Ms. Mary Helen Yoakum, who uh, also lives in Springfield. And Miss Mary Helen was born here in Springfield, and when she was 18 and done with high school, she went to Chicago. Um, she said that it should, Springfield was quite a segregated town when she was a young woman, and she thought there was um, more to life. There was a wider world waiting for her, and she wasn't scared, even though she was very young. She packed up, um, moved in with friends, had a job, um, took classes and um, studied at the Rainbow School of Design. And so this dress is something that she employed her dressmaking skills to do. Um, and she created this so she could go clubbing in the 1980s. She became part of a Chicago stepping scene and the step scene has its roots in Illinois. Um, in Chicago. And so she said she wore this on New Year's Eve out to the club with uh, three inch red stiletto heels. And so this is just a wonderful garment made by a woman for a woman for her own self. So she could dance to the beat of her own drummer. And I wanted to 
talk a little bit about this. Is it Eric had mentioned with the quilt and about this idea of labels and talking about with um, talking like with the costume as well too. It makes me think about this. One of the things we were talking about is just that uh, there is um, that there is this um, uh, sense of uh, of double, triple, you know, many layers, sort of intersections of labels that, that women and queer non-binary people carry with them uh, that men generally don't have to worry about, you know, having to carry these additional labels, uh, but also the expectations and the, uh, and so much of the work, like whether it's drag, which pulls from powerful female characters from movies and from uh, uh, literature or, um, or one's own biography, you know, if you find these powerful stories to speak louder than what is, you know, the, the cacophony that's around you. But artists, especially women artists, also used a lot of satire within the work, especially in, like this piece by Phyllis Gramson, which is called Baby Heidi Chair, uh, uh, sort of play on Baby High Chair. But Heidi was a, a fellow artist uh, in a, a women's art collective that she was involved with in Chicago in the 1970s. But her work, and we had a big piece on the wall, there's some other um, ramps and pieces around, um, kind of speak to the idea of, of, the, of women being sort of infantilized, made to appear or to seem like children, to seem like babies. And so her critique of that is this really wonderfully dense, creepy doll of in the small, squeezed into the small eye chair with like these girdle straps and other, you know, uh, other things associated through, through different time periods uh, to represent this almost like kind of half human, half creature idea that's a complaint about uh, how women are seen, how women are made to feel like they are evangelized, like children or a and secondary she's citizen. literally part of the furniture here, too. Yeah, she is. Yeah, she is built into the factory piece. So uh, Phyllis has done that throughout her career, has had this uh, very strong sort of critique of looking at the role of women, especially in relationship to how they're seen in a larger world and how they are, are expected to operate or move through a larger society. So. Shall we? There's some more to see. see there's more to see. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> we may do one more room, and yeah, so we'll yeah. hope that uh, folks will join us. You doing good there, camera crew? Yeah. <laughs> Our wonderful Sarah and Lorna for education here behind the scenes. We couldn't do this without you. And shout out to the whole education team here at the museum, who are an outstanding group of professionals that we have. So I'd like to direct your attention to um, these two carved pieces of furniture um, that were done in the early 20th century by Kate Baker Busey. And uh, Kate was a woman who <laughs> <laughs> And so um, Kate went to art school in Cincinnati as a young woman in the 1870s, and she was told that she couldn't study wood carving because that was a man's discipline. And she studied it anyway. And not only did she study and master the art of wood carving, but she went on to uh, open the door behind her to access for the skill. Um, she went to teach at the um, Hampton Institute, which is now known as Hampton University in Virginia, which at that time was a newly opened school for uh, Black and Native American students. And so she took that man's discipline and taught it to students, uh, men and women at this uh, new institute that was open. And so to me, um, I, I love the power of this woman breaking an artificial boundary that was set in front of her. Clearly, her wood carving doesn't need to be a man's discipline because she did a beautiful job. And so her unwillingness to accept these artificial limits put in front of her, and also that sense of opening the door for others um, so no one else has to be needlessly trapped by the same limitations. 
and they're just beautiful pieces. The carving, the decoration, how they sort of speak to the art history of the late 19th, early 20th century, a little bit of aesthetic movement, arts and crafts. There's a whole lot of things happening here. Um, but I think anybody would love to have something like this in their home. Yeah. The next thing we'd like to show um, is a creation, which we can only show in video form because it's physically rooted to East St. Louis, Illinois. And um, Patrice's creation, um, it's, it's a work of community art, is her community garden. And Patrice Preston Rogers is an amazing human being. And um, I had the, the pleasure of meeting her for the first time last year and visiting her garden. And uh, Patrice's beloved father um, passed away recently and he suffered from hypertension. Um, East St. Louis is considered a food desert, a place that doesn't have um, sufficient access to fresh or nutritious foods. And Patrice had inherited a plot of land from her father and was wondering what to do with it. Um, she, she considered selling it, um, but then she inspiration struck um, one day when she was watching TV and saw another community gardener and she knew in her heart that I need to turn this into um, my plot of land into a community garden. And she did it. And she um, is a woman who is determined and knows that she can make a difference and went out and pulled her community together, um, established this beautiful garden. And now it's some place that not only um, nourishes the body, but it also is a, is a place of peace and it's a place of reflection and it's a place that nourishes the soul and nourishes a sense of community. And so um, Patrice's creation here um, tells us that all it takes is one person with one idea and the heart to make a change um, who can really transform a community. Few other ones you'd like to talk about here? Oh, let's talk about the factory girls' work. Yeah. Um, we thought it was important to include um, some pieces by these are women who worked in factories. Um, the clock was uh, the dial was painted by um, women at the Radium Dial Company in Ottawa, Illinois. You may have heard them as the Radium Girls. There's a phenomenal book by Kate Moore that talks about um, kind of the, the trials and the struggles. Um, these are young working class women who got these um, very high paying jobs um, that they were able to skillfully execute. The, the kick was that these glow in the dark alarm clocks were used in radium based paint and radium fluoresces. And to get the fine numbers on these, and they were also painting little pocket watches, um, the women would tip the brushes between their lips. And every time they dip their brush into their lips, a little piece of residual radium based paint would be ingested. And so these women actually started to develop radium poisoning. And um, they brought their complaints to the company, and the company um, completely gaslit them, said, no, you know, you, you're healthy, we, we've tested you, the doctors say you're healthy, there's nothing going on. And um, these women eventually opened a lawsuit, um, took them a while to find a lawyer who would take their case because the radium dial company was a major employer in Ottawa and people didn't want to upset the boat and um, kind of upset this company that was providing all these jobs in town that they battled through. And finally, in the 1930s, um, on appeal, their case was uh, decided in their favor and their travails. And sadly, it was too late for many of them. Uh, many of them actually died of radium poisoning. But the legacy they left behind was um, the seeds of what would become the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, um, as well as in the, in the atomic age, um, people who were working on the Manhattan Project and working with radioactive materials to build the nuclear bomb. Um, um, they went and studied the Radium Girls medical records and were able to put in place health and safety um, guidelines so those workers wouldn't suffer the same ill effects. And next to them are hand-painted china pieces, and these were created um, probably around 200 years ago. And um, women in ceramic factories in England were employed to um, hand-paint china. And they were employed because it was thought that their little fingers were more nimble and dexterous and could do a better job. But also um, people like to hire women because they were thought to be more docile and less likely to protest against mistreatment. Um, and you could pay them uh, half to a third as much as you paid male workers. Um, so there are women whose uh, labor is being exploited and um, their, you know, the, the hope of their docility is being exploited. And that's still the case today. Um, there's still a wage gap in this country um, where I think we just passed um, the day where women catch up to what men make not too long ago. 
um, women make on average, I think it's about 82 cents for whatever men make. And especially in um, factory settings, in um, factories that have been outsourced in the textile industry, um, women are working in deplorable conditions. So um, these pieces here, um, Speak to us of these women whose names have been lost to history um, and who weren't preserved, and also are a reminder um, that the exploitation of women's labor continues today. Yeah, I think the history of women, women's labor and the labor movement has just been uh, just moved, uh, marched along, you know, side by side, including you know stories of that, of things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory mm -hmm. fire, you know, where. The conditions, the lives of women who are not named but have struggled and suffered, but have brought about, you know, through those situations, have brought about these small measures that have moved, hopefully, moved us forward towards a little more equity, a little more equality in the country. Um, but it's still going on. And um, is there anything else? What, are we, we end I, on? what I, well, what's your favorite piece? Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's maybe much. one of my favorite children. I know. <laughs> I I'll I'll end with the hair read yeah, because that's kind so. of a, a fun story. Um this was created by a school teacher who taught at a small school outside of Springfield in the early 20th century. Her name is Eunice Rogers, and she was her own woman. Um, I did a newspaper search of archival newspapers to see what we could learn about Eunice because we didn't know very much. And what came up was um, a couple court cases where she had been um, charged with uh, attempted murder or manslaughter because there was a man who was a, a tenant on her land who had made undue advances towards her. And so when he was riding by in her horse and carriage, uh, she took a shot at him with a gun outside her front door. And I just love the image of this um, school teacher, you know, this we think of a school marm as very prim and proper. And this was this woman who lived life on her own terms, wasn't going to take any undue advances from any men. And so what we're looking at is this um, it's a hair wreath. It's literally woven out of the hair of, um, in this case, her students. And um, she wasn't a serial killer. <laughs> this was actually a very common practice in uh, Victorian America. This was a keepsake because it's, it's such an intimate part of someone's body and weaving together hair from disparate people from her students creates this um, timeless, you know, hair will never disintegrate, timeless and beautiful um, creation that literally weaves together these relationships with these kids that she clearly cared very much for. Um, and I love it because hair is actually one of the strongest fibers on earth. And so this looks very beautiful and delicate and hair is um, as strong as steel and so is uh, Miss Rogers. It's a great, great story, especially with uh, taking pot shots at her tenant <laughs> suitor as well, too. Um, yeah, so, and there's so many other stories that's, that are in the exhibition, um, including some of the history of women that were involved with our museum from the 1930s on, you know, key players in making the uh, Illinois State Museum what it is today. Um, many of them who got their start with the Works Project Administration. Uh, during the Great Depression, when uh, many women had opportunities artistically and, and professionally as scientists, as researchers, as writers, to like step into a fields that were not open to them. Um, so we're very proud to, to tell their stories. You'll see them in a hallway when you come to the gallery, and so many more. Um, and just to tell you, the part of the exhibition is going to close early. Uh, it's uh, in at the end of uh, April, early May, uh, to make way for the noir um, exhibition that's coming. So especially the art pieces. So if you do want to see the exhibition in its entirety, please come between before May. But if not, uh, at least a good uh, half or more of the exhibition is going to be staying up all summer. Uh, and uh, it's an exhibition that's really, I think, uh, uh, worth looking at more than once. Absolutely. Come yeah. again and again. And we are free. We're open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 10 to 4. And there's no charge for admission. So there's really no excuse not to come. And there's a component to this exhibition as well, too, where we talk about what is missing from this collection. Uh, we've talked about the, you know, what women have had to do to sort of to make their voice heard, to be seen and recognized professionally. And um, like many museums, our, our museum is primarily is predominantly over 90% white. 
in terms of representation of what's in the collection. So the stories of black artists, of black makers, of Latinx makers and artists, of Asian makers and artists, of scientists, those voices in our state have not been well represented by our museum. And that's an effort that we are making, that we wanna make. Uh, and we've built this into the exhibit as well too, to ask people to tell us like, do you see yourself represented here? Do you see yourself seen here? And what it is missing and what we're working towards. And this is a long-term goal that we have uh, made the really diligent efforts towards in the last few years and are continuing to do it. It's stretching us. Um, you know, we're, there are two white curators here, you know, <laughs> talking about other people's lives, but we're trying to do our best as we can uh, to make this, to honor, really to honor and to celebrate. Because we, yeah, we can talk about this as struggle and the struggle is known, the struggle is out there, um, but it's also like, the speculative world, what if every one of these stories was the most important story out there? Uh, and whatever the next story, child, young person who comes through here and sees this and hopefully has that moment of like inspiration to say, yeah, I can do the same sort of thing. So yeah, part of this like wonderful objects, but like the most important stories behind them. Absolutely. You know, and whether they're famous or not, it doesn't matter. Um, so. We're storytellers. Yeah. And we want to know everybody's story. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> that is, do we have any questions? Is there anything that's come in uh, from the chat at all? Or? Good, okay. So is that... Uh... So Doug, what is your favorite piece? Okay, we okay, saw then... Erica's. Well, what is your favorite piece? Is that, is that, is that your... Or one of them. This one is your favorite? You have really said yeah. or... I, I love the community garden. I, I think that has yeah, such um, yes. such broad reach and, and bias because I know Patrice and she's amazing. So that's, that's and, my and we, favorite. We turned it on, turned it off. So it is playing during the exhibition we go to. So come see that. Um, well, again, like nod to Elizabeth's uh, uh, Zahn's nudging. I love the collage wall. Uh, that was for me as a curator. What we do is, you know, we spend time just like going through our stacks and finding those pieces that start to speak to each other, speak together. Um, some of these pieces probably have not been out on display uh, uh, since they've been acquired, some have, but um, it's, it's not about the singular object. I mean, so much of the museum world has sort of paid attention to the idea of the singular object. Ooh, good answer. I know, and we're looking at the the tapestry. The tapestry, the, the plurality, yes. you know, the whatever it might be. Uh, and so that is sort of like a piece for me. But that's kind of a favorite. Does that answer your question, Lorna? <laughs> okay, go ahead. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for sticking with us through our technical issues. Um, we hope that you were able to hear us a little better towards the end. Um, and in the future, when we're doing programs on the second floor, we will see what we can do about sound. We hope that you come out and see the exhibit. So have a great night, everyone. <laughs>